and good morning, ladies. I'm excited to be with you. I'm excited to be in person. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I said that to my sister before. I said, I'm so glad to be outside of the box, literally outside of the box. Um, I think this is my first ministry engagement face to face. I mean, I've done a ton of Zoom, you know, women's conferences, and I'm so very grateful for the use and the tool that God has given us for the, of the internet and social media and all those things. But there is nothing quite like being with one another in true fellowship. And so I am just blessed to be with you this morning. I am blessed because I feel like when I am invited to Fordham Manor Church, I'm invited home. Um, and that's because for those of you who know me, um, you know my relation to the church. Um, I am a very proud family member of the Rivera family. Um, Pastor Irving is my uncle in love. Uh, my uncle Mo, Moses Rivera, as you all I know, lovingly know him. Um, he is my uncle in love also. And so I'm so honored and blessed that God grafted me into a family with such a rich um, culture of Christianity and a love for the ministry and it was something that I prayed for when I was a teenager um, that God would do for me and he did that and so my husband is Joshua that is Irving and um, Moses's son um, Carlos he's come and he's visited the church many times here that is my father in love um, and so I again I'm blessed to be part of the family legacy here of the house and so over the years I've come in different capacities I remember coming a few years ago we did a couples I don't know if any of you were here for that but a couples paint night and that was really fun so I'm also um, not only do I minister um, in word but I also am a Christian visual artist and so God has been um, very good and generous to me in the area of giftings. My first love, my true gifting from, you know, birth was um, singing. And so I, we're going to worship a little bit later. And thank you, Pastor Olga, for that beautiful worship. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, I, I, I unofficially met and yet officially met Pastor Olga in a Zoom meeting. We met in the box. Um, and I'm grateful. See, that's why I'm grateful for the box, because I've developed relationships in COVID. Has anyone developed relationships in COVID? Isn't it strange? Like, we think things can only happen one way, and then God allows, not that he is the author of it, but he allows a pandemic to happen and a quarantine to happen, and yet he never stops moving. He never stops connecting us, and so I'm really grateful for all that. So right now in my life, I'm going through a very interesting transition. Um, we are now Connecticuts, which I think is the appropriate term for residents of Connecticut. If I have that wrong, please come correct me later. Um, <laughs> but I did live in the Bronx for 20, uh, 25 years. Um, I, we just moved out of the home that my husband and children have ever known. Um, and so we've been up there for about a month now. It's it's taking some getting used to, um, but I was just really um, fixated on hearing the Lord. It was my first drive down to the Bronx um, this morning by myself without my crew of children. I have five, but I don't have small children. I have three college-age students and two teenagers, so when you are trying to find anyone to pray for, just know I have a young adult slash youth group living in my house. So just pray for me. And we have lots more room now. So that one can go there and that one can go there. But still, just keep your girl in prayer because, you know, it's real. It gets real sometimes. <laughs> Amen, right? All the mothers are like, yes, girl. I know. <laughs> so it was my, on my drive down, I just kept hearing the Holy Spirit just speak to me about you all and just I could feel his ministry in the car towards you already. And God has definitely put a word um, on my heart for you. Um, and I, I, I just want you to settle in this morning. I really want you to just settle into his presence. Settle into his glory. His glory is a beautiful place to rest yourself. Some of us are afraid of the glory. Some of us hide from the glory. Some of us hide from the embrace of the Holy Spirit and we fight and we're stubborn and we don't mean to be because we really do love him. But I heard him say, not in these words, these are mine because I don't know if God talks woosa, but I heard a big woosa, like 
just take a deep breath. Can you do that with me this morning? Can you just take one deep breath in your mask? I know that's kind of crazy to ask, but on the count of three, can we just take one deep breath together? One, two, three. And I hear the Holy Spirit saying, just be still, Mama. Be still, Mama. It's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. Whatever you've got going on, just place that thing in the front, in the forefront of your mind right now. Whether your eyes are closed or open, just put it in the forefront. And just hear the words of the Holy Spirit this morning saying to you, be still, Mama. It's going to be okay. Come rest in the presence of God and find rest for the weariness of your soul. Father, we thank you this morning that your goal is to come make your presence known. You left us the gift of the Holy Spirit so that we would never feel alone. Yet some of us this morning, God, are walking around in a state of loneliness, looking for your presence, trying to find you in the midst of the chaos and the confusion going on in the world and in their lives. So I pray this morning that your Holy Spirit reveals the Son and the nature of his work within each and every one of us. I thank you that you've come, Holy Spirit, with a breaker's anointing to break up all the foul ground, to break up all the misconceived notions about who you are. Father, I pray this morning that you would tear down the thoughts in our heart and in our mind that don't line up with who you really are and the will of your spirit for us. Father, we dedicate this time to you. I pray that you would make the path straight. I can't do it, God. But you can. You can make every crooked place straight in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. I feel his presence already, and I really hope that you feel it too. So, you know, when I spoke with Pastor Olga earlier this week, you know, I asked her, is there a theme or is there something um, that you'd really like for me to focus on, you know, for the women. And she said one word. It's so funny, that one word thing. You know, God could speak a word. All you got to do is speak one word. And Pastor Olga spoke one word. She said, uncertainty. And I thought to my, I was sitting in a pizzeria when you had, when we had spoken that day and I was with my husband and, you know, we're exploring all these different parts of Connecticut now. So we found this pizzeria and we're sitting down and we're talking and life feels strange and I'm trying to make it familiar to me. And then Pastor Olga says this word and I'm like, yeah, there's so much of that happening. Not just because of COVID, and I know that there is because of our government and the state of our world. And I, I feel like we hear so much about that on the news already. So I don't want to come and inundate you with more cliche ideas and, and words. And that's all good. And I appreciate every minister and every person who is bringing empowerment and encouragement in the spirit in this hour, you know, and speaking life into the state of our world. And so I, I, I bless them for that. However... As my week progressed, I found myself feeling, feeling very lonely. And then I felt very guilty because God literally took us from a pit of circumstance. And that's a whole other testimony that I wish I could get into today, but maybe another time, maybe in a Zoom box. <laughs> but here I was feeling lonely and guilty because here God was blessing me with more than I had ever imagined that he could ever bless me with. And I was feeling so alone. And the reason I was feeling so alone was because I was so unfamiliar with my situation. And I felt like the children of Israel who were like, well, you brought us out of Egypt and now we're in a promised land, but I don't, we don't see you the way that we saw you. Oh, thank you so much. You just read my mind, my spirit, my heart, everything. You read it. <laughs> Discernment. Yes, Lord. Um, so, I, you know, and I thought to myself, Lord, you know, what's going on? 
I, 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 like I said, I felt like the children of Egypt when they were like, you brought us out of here, but you brought us out, and now we're feeling like you don't have our back. And maybe the circumstances were a little bit different for them than they were for me. But that's how I felt. So that's why I felt guilty because I was like, oh, no, I don't want to be like that, Lord. I want to live my life of gratitude. I want to constantly in silence or with, you know, an open mouth. I want to give you glory. I want to give you praise. And I felt guilty because I felt like maybe God was condemning me. But I said to myself, there's so much uncertainty. And there that word came up again. There's so much uncertainty, and Lord, you know, I don't want to feel like I am a weak person just because I'm in an unfamiliar place. Does that make sense? You ever been like a fish out of water, and like all of a sudden, the way you see yourself is just not the norm. You don't really see yourself the way you would if you were in a position that was comfortable and maybe stable for you. Sometimes when you're in a place of obscure, obscurity and you're, God's taking you through, you know, a valley experience or a desert experience, you can forget about who you really are. Sometimes you can be on a mountaintop and you can forget who you really are. And, you know, I had to pray and I had to get on my face before the Lord and I had to say, Lord, what do I do with this uncertainty. And it's funny because when you said the word to me, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. We all know about uncertainty. You know, like we think we know it all, right? I don't know. Am I the only one? Okay. <laughs> so, you know, the mother of five in me is like, I know everything. <laughs> I know everything. I should have a medical degree at this point. I know everything. I should be a professor. I should have my doctorate and whatever. Anyway, so I think I know everything. And then I realized when this wave, and it feels like a wave sometimes, a wave kind of hits you and it knocks you off your feet and it throws you off balance. And it feels like you almost get the breath kind of just taken out of you and you don't know what to do or where to go. I said, Lord, what do I do in this uncertainty? And then he reminded me of when I was a teenager. And so I'm going to give you sort of the Cliff Notes version of my story. Um, I was actually born in Bogota, Colombia, and I was sold into this country when I was three months old. I was flown over by an anonymous woman to this country, and I was adopted by a Jewish family. Because it was an illegal black market adoption, I was raised by a mental, severely undiagnosed mentally ill mother who later on we would find out struggled and had mild schizophrenia, a form of psychosis, and severe bipolar disorder. She has passed away and so has my adopted father, but as you can only imagine, it was a nightmare growing up in her care. I was severely physically abused. On the outside, I had everything any could, kid could have ever wanted. I grew up in a very affluent neighborhood out by Long Island. We had a country house. We had all the money that we needed. We shopped in high-end stores. And from the outside, it just looked perfect. It looked like they were the saviors of this poor little Colombian orphan. And yet nobody knew what was happening within the walls of our home. And I don't know if you've ever read the book A Child Called It, but it is a memoir of a, of a man who was severely physically abused by his mother, which is the only way I ever really describe my level of abuse growing up. It is only by the hand and the grace of God that I am alive. It is only by his grace that I am alive. When I was 15, through, through, it was a series of events, but when I was 15 years old, a case was brought against my adopted mother, and ACS became involved, and I was removed from my home. My mother deeply, deeply hated me. I believe it was also the enemy's plan to use someone because that's always, right? He doesn't know the future, but he studies us. He doesn't know the future, but he knows who to use to try to destroy us from when we're really young. And so through a series of events, I got removed from her home. And then about eight months later, her, my adopted father, gave up all parental right of me through the New York State court system. And I became an orphan all over again, and I became a ward of New York State. 
I was in the foster care system. I stayed connected with some family. I have some family in Israel. I grew up with a deep, beautiful faith in Judaism. I went to Hebrew school. I rebelled and didn't get my bat mitzvah because I didn't have it at like the really bougie spot that like all the other kids were having it at. So I was like, mm, I'm not having it then. But I went to Hebrew school my whole childhood. I went to temple every Saturday and I loved God. I really did. I, I believed in him. I was taught that I should never take Jesus as Messiah. I was taught that. I was taught that I should never believe in him, that he was a prophet, that he existed, but that I should never take him as Messiah. And I saw him like the underdog. I saw him as like the rejected one. And I was like, oh, one day I'm going to know. I'm going to know who he is. And I kind of fixated myself at like about nine, ten years old. I said to myself, I'm going to find out who this Jesus guy is. I'm going to find him one day. And so anyway, fast forward, I was in foster care. I went from foster home to foster home. I was a runaway. I was the worst kid in my entire foster care agency. By that point, I had been in mental hospitals. I was also part of a foster care agency that was mental treatment based. I was, I was on drugs. I was taking medications. I was caught up with the wrong people. I was running the streets. I was homeless. And when I was 17 years old, I was raped by a man who had HIV. I was held against my will. And I was raped by a man who had HIV and nothing has ever touched my body. I am here, I am here only because of the blood of Jesus. I am here only because of the grace of God. I am here only because the hand of the Almighty Father has been upon my life from three months of age when I was set adrift in my own kind of basket, like Moses. And then like Joseph, rejected and abused and abandoned by my family and thrown into a pit and taken from affluent neighborhood, taken from all the things anybody could have ever wanted for their children or the kind of lifestyle we all kind of want after and thrown into poverty and thrown into homelessness and thrown into governmental dependent living. Everything stripped from me, everything. Dignity. I had no dignity. Respect. I had no respect. I was extremely promiscuous. I put myself in situations that, again, only by the grace of God is it that I stand here. Only by his grace. And so when I was a teenager, um, I ended up, I was in a performing arts school for singing. Singing has always been my first love. When I was a little girl, I was like, I want to be Whitney Houston when I grow up. I want to be Mariah Carey. I want to be all the, you know, the big names. And that was the vision that sort of held me when I was going through tragedy and I was going through trials. It was this vision because without vision, the people perish. And how faithful is God that I can look back before I even knew who his son was. And yet he was caring so diligently for me as a little girl sitting in my adopted home, being abused, but yet seeing great vision. Having something to hold on to in the midst of obscurity and darkness. And so when I was a teenager, I was in, I was in a performing arts school, which led me into the music industry. So I both worked in the mu music industry and I was singing in the music industry. So I was on both sides of it. And we were on tour in Atlanta, and I had a group. I was singing in, in this three-girl group, and one of the girls knew my story and said, you need Jesus. And I was like, no, I don't. <laughs> yes, you do, she said to me. And as we sat there and did drugs together, oh, okay, I'm so sorry about that. Siri wanted to get in on the conversation. And as we were standing there, I'll never forget it, it was after a rehearsal we were doing for an upcoming show, she, we were doing drugs, and she looked at me and told me I needed this savior, told me that I should come to church, and somehow convinced me, but we now know, I now, now know, that it was the drawing, the loving kindness, the drawing of the Holy Spirit to his son, that convinced me and convicted me that I needed a savior because I had even no idea what sin was. She said, well, you need Jesus because we all sin. Well, what's sin? 
And you would think, I was a Jew, I grew up, you know, I had a reverence of God. At that point, I kind of professed atheism. I was very, very angry, very, I was, I was just an enraged kid. And I know it was the Holy Spirit that convicted me. And so I ended up going to church. And when I was 17 years old, I lifted my hands at that altar to Jesus. And every part of me crumbled and yet came totally alive. In the midst of a moment, I understood what real love was. I understood that there was promise and purpose on the other side of this really dark night of my soul that I had endured since I was a baby. And in one moment, everything just seemed to make sense. All of it. All of it. I never saw my life past the age of 18. I thought that I'd either commit suicide. I thought that I would be dead somewhere. In fact, a few weeks before I went on this tour in Atlanta, I got caught in a shootout outside of a nightclub. And as I was running, we were all just, it was a crowd of us running, and there was a young man standing on the side of me, and he was like, if this, if this is me, that was him, this close next to each other, and we're running side by side, and we're running away from the sounds of the gunshots, and I see him from my peripheral view just hit the ground. I keep running. I get into a place of safety, and I turn around, and this man lay in a pool of blood. And I stood over him as the police came, as the ambulance came, as they tended to him, and I was weeping. But when I tell you I was weeping, I mean, I was sobbing. They thought I was his girlfriend or his sister or a family member. They didn't know who I was. And I, and I, I, I couldn't even talk. They were like, ma'am, um, excuse me, you know, are you related to him? Are you there? And I just, I, it was like a movie. It was like I was just in shock. I'd never seen that much blood in my entire life. It was running down the street. And I couldn't understand why he had been shot and I think killed that night. I'm not really sure what happened to him. I didn't understand why was it him and not me. And it was that moment, it was truly that moment that made me ask again and made me acknowledge God again. And it was several weeks later that I ended up on this tour and my friend told me about Jesus. And so when I, when I gave it to him, when I gave my life to him, let me tell you, I gave it all. And when I tell you I gave it all, it was like he, he, it was, he unlocked every chain. He broke through every wall. He melted me in ways that no human being on the face of the earth could have done within me. I always explain it like drinking liquid love because I was so cold and I was so hardened. People say like, well, what changed you? It's like imagine walking outside on a really, really cold day or being on top Mount Everest. I don't know if you've ever seen these like documentaries about these people that climb to the top of that mountain and how freezing they are. And like you just get cold watching the documentary. You're like, oh my God, where's my sweater? I just I feel for you. It's like that. Imagine just being so cold. And then someone just coming with this just amazingly wonderful hot cup of coffee. I'd say tea, but I am not a tea lover. So I'm going to say bustelo. Like, what if someone just came and put it in your hand and just the warmth that enters your body after only ever knowing something so dark and so cold? And who can turn away from that feeling? I, I had searched for this feeling my entire 17 years of life. I tried to find it in my promiscuous life. I tried to find it with fake friends. I tried to find it in various different ways that only ended up hurting and wounding me. And now here was this beautiful Jesus. This beautiful Holy Spirit that made his home inside of someone like me. And now everyone who knew that I was crazy, who knew that I was like all over the place, I mean, forget it. I had like 17 social workers. Uh, I mean, the precinct, the local precinct at my foster home, the one that I ended up staying in the longest, they had my picture on the wall. I went AWOL all the time because I was a ward of New York State. So anytime I went missing, they already knew who I was. I mean, this is how bad it was. And so I went from like, Saul to Paul, and everybody was like, whoa, who is this girl? All of a sudden, I was nice. I had a smile on my face. 
I wanted to help people. I wanted to encourage people. And it was like they could just see it. I remember my, my therapist. I went to therapy for seven and a half years because of the abuse that I endured. And I thank God every day for that woman. Her name was Lainey Shahar. If you ever need someone to pray for, remember Lainey Shahar in your prayers. Because I ask God all the time to bless her and keep her. Because she was an angel sent from heaven when I didn't know the comfort of the counsel of the Holy Ghost. And God used her to bind up wounds in me when I was a teenager. And I remember when I got saved and she saw the turnaround and she saw the glory and she saw the change and she was a witness to the difference. It's very unprofessional as a psychologist, psychiatrist, a therapist to do this, but she broke down in her office weeping. And that's when I knew the change was real. Because here was this woman who had walked with me from when I was 13 years old till I was almost 20, who watched me, who watched me and saw everything that I had endured. And here she was weeping. And so anyway, when I gave my life to him, I gave it all. I left the music industry. I dedicated my life to him. I started praying and fasting and forget it. By the time I was 18, every door started flying open to preach the gospel. I mean, it was just like, what? You want me to talk? You want me to speak? And my poor youth pastor, anybody, anybody know um, Pastor Mitchell Torres from Harvest Field Community Church? Okay, so he, uh, you know, is just a really good family friend. He was my very first pastor ever. He was my youth pastor. He was the very first person to ever allow me to have a mic in my hand. <laughs> and he said, Lee, I want you to share your testimony. And I was like, okay. And I spoke for two and a half hours. And he turned to me and said, that is the longest testimony anybody has ever given in this church. He's like, but I'm glad you did it. I won't keep you here today for two and a half hours. I promise I won't. <laughs> but it is a testament that when you can't see something within yourself, that God will use someone else to call out the greatness and the anointing and the call of God within you. Because after that day, because he was anointed for the job, he was anointed to call out the greatness in me. And after that day, doors started flying open. And since then, I've been to the most incredible places. I've been to different countries, different states, different cities, businesses, organizations, churches, everywhere. I even represented the United States of America at a convention called the Convention of the Rights of the Child. This was about a decade ago in Stockholm, Sweden, where the Queen of Sweden was there and 60 different nations with dignitaries and politicians were represented from all around the world. Why? To simply share my story. To simply lift up the name of Jesus. To simply declare his works and my faith and where that had brought me to as a product of a child who was an orphan. God has opened up the most incredible doors. He's opened up the most incredible. He's given me influences and places that never in my wildest dreams when I was homeless and on the street and begging for quarters so I could, you know, make a dollar out of 15 cents and feed myself on the street. Did I ever imagine that God would put me in the places that he has to even affect influence in our presidency right now? What God can do with the darkness and the brokenness of our lives far will surpass any idea, any preconceived notion that we have about ourselves. So what I'm going to need you to do for the next 15 minutes as I share a biblical story with you and a prophetic word that I believe the Lord has is I need you, I don't want you, I need you to lay down any and every preconceived notion that you have about yourself and your future. I dare even say that I'm going to need you to lay down even the good things. Because sometimes the good things that we think we can accomplish can become a stumbling block. Because God wants to do great things. He don't just want to do good things. He doesn't want to just do something that you admire in your mama or your grandmother or that pastor or that minister or that preacher. He wants to do so much more, so much more. Oh, my gosh. He is the God of the pit, and he is the God of the promise. 
He is the same God. And I know we hear this all the time. But he is the same God yesterday in the Old Testament to the New Testament, to the the, the beginnings of the church, to the church, the state of the church now. He's the same God yesterday and today and forever. And if you can find yourself in the word, oh my God, if you can find yourself in this book, then you have not only found yourself, but you found the identity for your children and your children's children and your churches and your neighborhoods and your country and your communities. If you can find yourself in the word, if you can grab a hold of a vision of somebody in this word, maybe for you that's Joseph, maybe it's Esther, maybe it's Paul, maybe it's Moses, You've got to know that if you will grab a hold of the vision that you can see in the word of God, he will do it for you. It is not an illusion. And I have this Holy Ghost feeling that there are some of you walking through a desert place and you're believing God for something, but you're believing, but you're, 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 you've seen the vision, but then you think it's a mirage. You think, oh, maybe my eyes are playing tricks on me. Maybe my dream is too big. Maybe my ideas are just too far-fetched. Maybe I'm thinking way too far outside of the box. I could never accomplish that. Why do I think that someone like me could stand in a position like that or own something like that or have that much money or be in that career field or be given that sort of reputation that I stand back and only look at and admire. Come on, God is a good God. He wants to give his children good things. My God, if that's one thing I have learned about God in this season, I waited 24 years on God to break open the chains from where we were living in the projects where I raised my five kids, where I taught them about Jesus, where I poured in the love of God, where I learned how to serve him in the little and the much. I waited 24 years, and he held back the seas. He held back the waters from my release, and in those 24 years, what I imagined God would do, sometimes that vision became weary in me. Sometimes I didn't want to fixate myself on hope, and yet God kept telling me, no, I want you, like Paul said, be a slave. Be a slave to hope, and be my servant in season and out of season. You find the greatest, greenest pastures in the valley, The greenest pastures are found in the valley. We're all looking for the greener pastures up on the mountaintop, but my friend, that is not where they exist. Those still waters, that beautiful, lush, green pastures where we find rest that David so beautifully and eloquently spoke about in Psalm 23 is found in the valley. It's found in the midst of suffering. We don't like to talk about this as a church, But this is where we find him. This is where we find the glory. This is where we find the intimacy. This is where we find the fellowship. And this is where we need to say, Lord, come what may. Come a pandemic. Come a threat to my health. Come a threat to my family. Come a threat to my safety. No matter what, I will serve you. I will find you in the valley and I will find you on the mountain. And everywhere in between, I will worship. And everywhere in between, I will set up an altar the same way that Abraham did. And I will worship there. I will worship in my going and in my coming. I will worship when I sit down and when I rise up. I will worship you when I am sitting at the table with my children and telling them the stories of your wonders and your faithfulness. And I will tell of your stories when I'm sitting, crying, weeping with my sister who doesn't know what to do or how to handle her home. I will tell of your goodness and I will worship you when I have much in my pantry and on my table. And when I can't afford nothing at Christmas, I will worship you because I will have no other gods before you. Because I will have no other idols sitting on the throne of my heart 
Because the only residence, the only authority that I will give, the throne of my heart, is where Jesus sits. So I wanted to just share very briefly with you about the story of Gideon. And I know a lot of you are super familiar with that story. And I'm not sharing this story probably the way that you think I'm going to share this story. Because I feel like there's a cliche to telling this story. I'm going to get it from my phone because I don't think I'm connected to Wi-Fi in here. But I'm going to read it from the amplified version, which I love. But if you can get Judges 6, we're just going to read Judges 6, verses 11 to 18. And I want to pull something out of this portion of scripture that you may not have realized was there because I didn't realize it was there. But maybe you are a better scholar than me. And, you know, that's cool. But I want to remind you then of something that this word says that I think will bring great comfort to us in a season of uncertainty. If I had a title for this message, in my church we do titles all the time. But it's not a Sunday. So is it weird to have a title and it's not a Sunday? Not a Sunday. I, I, you know, whatever. We can, who cares? We don't have to fit in the box. <laughs> if I had a title, it would be called The Promise of Your Presence. The Promise of His Presence. I was saying something before I got into sharing my story, and that was, in the midst of my uncertainty, I asked God, what do I do? And he reminded me of when I was in foster care and I had first gotten saved. And I came to know his presence. And every foster home I had been in, when I got saved, the Lord would tell me to be still. And I began to learn how to rest in his presence. That wherever I rested my head, wherever I went, he was there. His promise has and always will be to me, and I hope for you, the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives. We can seek accolades and we can seek materialistic things. And it's not that God doesn't want to give those things to us because he wants to richly bless his children. I am learning this. And I am learning to say that with confidence. With no religious guilt attached to it. Amen? Amen. 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 God wants to give good gifts to his kids. But beyond and above all those things, we seek first the promise of his presence. And everything else will follow that, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And Matthew 6 talks about all the earthly things, the clothing, the food, all that stuff. He wants his presence to be sought after first and foremost. Okay, so Judges 11. <clears throat> um, I'm sorry. Did I say Judges 11? I didn't mean Judges 11. I meant Judges 6, verse 11. Okay, I might. I am so sorry. All right, verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree at Ophrah. Ophrah, whatever, however you pronounce that. Which belonged to Joash, the Abizrite. And his son Gideon was beating wheat in the wine press instead of the thresh threshing floor to hide it and to save it from the Midianites. So at this point, <clears throat> the people of God were in captivity to the Midianites. And so, you know, there was a lot of fear surrounding, right, the nation. And they had not been able to see <clears throat> the deliverance of the Lord as of yet. And so this is kind of where Gideon comes in because there's a war to fight, right? Wherever there's captivity, there's a battle. Where, whether that means it's sin or territory of land, or where, wherever there's captivity, there is a battle. So. Here we see Gideon, and he's hoarding, because that's what he's doing. He's afraid. He's, he's getting the, want, the wheat together so that he can store it from, for himself, because what was happening was the Midianites were coming in, and they were stealing, because that's what the enemy does, right? Right? We get our blessing, and then the enemy, whether it's peace or joy or things, the enemy tries to come in and rob and steal and kill. So here he is, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, O brave man. Now, this was before he went into battle. So check this out. It says, But Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And so immediately he begins to question. He begins to question God's presence. 
He begins to question his personal and communal place as a favored child of God. And he begins to struggle with his identity because he says, and where are all his wondrous works, which our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us in the hands of the Midian. So he's struggling here. He's struggling because he can't see God's goodness. He's arguing and he's objecting towards the validity of the promises of God, of the wonders of God that have existed in days of old. And he's saying to himself, I can't see how that's even going to come to pass. So then as we go on, it says, the Lord turned to him and said, go in this strength of yours and save, the, and save Israel from the hand of the Midian. Have I not sent you? But Gideon said to him, please, Lord, how am I to rescue Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. Just so typical, right? The excuses. This is why I said I'm going to need you to lay down everything that you think you are, even the good parts. Just lay it down. Any preconceived notions of what you are able to accomplish on this side of heaven. We are given borrowed time. And whatever time we've lost, God promises to redeem that time. But lay down your preconceived notions because it's bigger. And he's calling out something in you today that's far greater than maybe what your eyes have been able to, be to behold in the mirror. Amen? So the Lord answered. He said, I will certainly be with you. And you will strike down the Midianites. And Gideon replied to him, If I have found any favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who speaks with me. Gideon confesses here his doubt and his mistrust. And you have to know this morning that whatever doubt or mistrust you have about God, it is okay. I'm going to say that one more time. Whatever mistrust, it's easy for us to be like, I'm trusting in Jesus. I'm trusting in the Lord. It's sound, we know all the right things to say. We, and we know how to say it. We know how to play tricks on our minds. And you know, just be careful with that because we can, yes, I understand the power of confession. I get all that. But when you deny the things that you're walking through, you are denying the authority of Christ to come and fellowship with you in your heartache and in the places that are difficult. You are denying God access and you are denying yourself the experience of receiving his glory and his strength in your weakness. So we have to be careful with this whole name it and claim it and speak it and believe it. Yes, should we speak life? Always. But we also need to be very honest with ourselves because we cannot progress in this life unless we are honest with what we see in the mirror. And if you are mistrusting today, it is okay. And if you have doubt in your heart that God wants to, is willing to, and able to do the thing which you're believing him for, it is okay. And your doubts and your worries and your concerns and your anxieties have found a safe place in Jesus where you will not be rejected, where you will not be cast off, where you will not be looked down upon, where you will not be told that you're not strong enough, where you will not be, you know, made to, made to be shamed. You are in a safe place. Your weakness is in a safe place with Jesus. Sometimes we forget that, being in the church so long, serving him for so many years, being in ministry. We forget that he is our safe place. His presence is the safest place where we can take all the cares of this world and lay them down at his feet. I'm grateful this morning that he's reminding us of that. And so this is my favorite part of the scripture. Gideon says, to the angel of the Lord, because he thinks he's just seeing an angel, but we know this was Jesus. If you do a real in-depth biblical study, this was Jesus. And he says to the angel of the Lord, please do not depart from here until I come back to you and bring my offering and place it before you. Because 
See, Gideon wasn't prepared to be met by the presence of God. He wasn't prepared to be overwhelmed by the glory of God. So he says to the angel of the Lord, could you just wait? It's like, I don't believe, but like you're here now, so I believe. Just wait. I really want to like honor you because you, you, you met me here. Like you're calling out my grace. You're here. And so the response, my God, this is where I just literally, I started bawling. Because God is so humble and meek and gentle and kind. And we know that he is a mighty warrior. And we know he is the commander of all of the armies of heaven. But yet there's this side to Jesus that we have to cling to in uncertainty. And when we don't know whether we're coming or going, or we don't know whether his presence is going with us or not, when we don't understand, this is his response. The angel of the Lord says, and he said, I will wait until you return. Think about the God of all of heaven and earth. The God of all of heaven and earth. All of heaven, put the stars in the sky, put the moon in its place, allows the sun to come out day in and day out, holds the earth in his hand, puts breath in your lungs, puts food on your table when you don't know how you're going to get it there. This God says to Gideon, I will wait for you. Now, I don't know if you really understand the weight of that. But the God of all heaven and earth, not the God that we familiarize ourselves with, not the parts of Jesus and the Holy Spirit that we feel like we have figured out. No, I'm talking about the whole God. I'm talking about the whole thing. I'm talking about every part of him. Looks at Gideon and says to him, I will wait for you to return. And then Gideon goes, and if you keep reading it, Gideon goes and he gets meat and he, he puts it on an altar and the, and, and the angel takes his staff and he, he burns it up because it's not his offering that he needs. The, the, the Lord doesn't need your offering. Understand the context here. He doesn't need your offering, but he wants to see if you're willing to serve him in the middle of your uncertainty. In the middle of your unbelief about who he is and what he can do, all he wants to know is, are you willing? Because if you're willing, my God, he will wait. He will wait for you. He will wait. And that doesn't, that, that, I know I just messed up some of your theology. I know I messed up some religious things that you have thought. I understand obedience. I get it. And I'm not trying to say any of you should be disobedient. But what I'm telling you is, when you cannot, because you live in your flesh, and there is a constant battle happening between the flesh and the spirit, and when you cannot get yourself to a place to be obedient, he says, I see your heart, and I know that you're willing, and I'm standing here waiting and ready and willing and able whenever you're ready. And I believe that's a prophetic word for someone this morning. That's a prophetic word from the throne room of heaven because he is willing to wait for you. Come on, our God, our God. Our God is willing to wait for us? You mean he's willing to hold our hand when we feel like we're walking in darkness and we don't want to trust him? You mean he's waiting on me? You mean, and he's not waiting on me like with his hand on his hip like how, you know, we wait for our kids. He's not waiting like that. He's just alongside us. He's walking with us. And he's whispering words of empowerment, encouragement, and love, and comfort, and wisdom. And he's not going to stop doing that. And so I would just, I just want everybody to stand to their feet right now. And I believe with everything in me that there are some people in here that need to lay down their condemnation. As I was praying and I was, as I was seeking the Lord, I saw a heavy spirit of condemnation. Now, there's a difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction of the Holy Spirit brings you closer to the presence of God. Condemnation and self-guilt come from a prideful place. 
and lead you away from the presence of God. Now, it takes discernment in a dark time in our lives to know the difference between the two. And so when God convicts our heart, it's because he wants us to be able to draw closer so we can see with open eyes and open hearts and open minds. When the enemy condemns, he wants to shut off your vision. And it's a good way for you to discern right now in this moment whether or not you're functioning out of the conviction of the Holy Spirit or the condemnation that comes from the pit of hell. Now, earlier I was praying and I said that I believe that there was a breaker's anointing because I saw ground, shaky ground. Shaky ground that doesn't belong to you. Shaky ground because, because God wants to make your path straight. God wants to give you certainty in his presence. Forget about the world. Forget about it. Forget about putting your trust in government. Forget about putting your trust in a vaccine. Forget about putting your trust in people's words to you. Forget it. Forget about putting your trust in your boss to give you that promotion. Forget it. Forget it. Take all those things and throw them out. Because the only thing you need is to be reassured of the promise of his presence in your life. So the foul ground is all the things that we put our trust in that are not his presence, that are not the promise of his presence. And when we begin to walk on the straight and narrow road of his presence, he f gives us favor with the boss. <laughs> And he gives us favor with our finances and he gives us favor and he opens up the doors and he breaks the chains and he does all these things because we're seeking after the promise of his presence. Why don't we just lift our hands to heaven? Father, I just thank you right now, God. I thank you, Lord. You are not a man that you should lie or the son of man that you should repent. And you have spoken these things in the spirit into existence. And it is your job to bring them to pass. So right now in Jesus' name, every daughter of the Most High God, under the sound of my voice, I believe today is being freed from a spirit of condemnation that has led her away from the promise of your presence. I declare now in Jesus' name that every foul ground that she has been standing on, unknowingly, unwillingly, not realizing that she got caught up in deception and is now standing in a place that is not serving her any good. I declare in Jesus' name it's being broken by the power of the Holy Ghost. And I declare that stability, the stability of the promise of the presence of God is girding her up and causing her to stand with a stability and a longevity, a strength and a witness beyond everything that she has experienced before. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that when we ask for forgiveness of sin, that you throw our sins into the sea of forgetfulness to remember them no more. So I break every chain of condemnation now in the name of Jesus. It has no place here. And every demonic lie that has infiltrated the ears of the hearer of your daughters that keeps them away from the promise of your presence, I rebuke and command to go back to the pit of hell from where it first came, never to return again. Lord, we thank you for the spirit of deliverance, God. We thank you for every broken chain, God. We thank you for every prison door, every mental prison door right now that is being opened by the power of the blood of Jesus. I command and cut down the spirit of fear in Jesus' name. I command that the torment of anxiety has no place in this house, in the house of the believer in Jesus' name. I command every tormenting demonic influence ceases today. In Jesus' name, I speak peace right now, peace 
over the mental and emotional and soulish tor torment and, 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 and tossed storm right now, Lord. In Jesus' name, I just speak peace to it right now. Peace to it. I thank you that there is freedom here, God. I thank you that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I thank you right now, Holy Ghost. I thank you. I thank you for your prophetic word. Why don't you just begin to thank Jesus? Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. Hallelujah. We praise your holy name. We give you honor. We give you glory, God. We thank you, God, because in this place, oh God, we will remember your name. We will remember your wonders, oh God. In this place in our lives, God, we thank you because we will set up an altar, God. And we will remember that you made yourself known today on this day, God. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Freedom reigns in this place. Showers of mercy and grace. Falling on every face, there is freedom. Freedom reigns in this place. Showers of mercy and grace, falling on every face. There is freedom. Mercy falls in this place. Showers of mercy and grace falling on every face. There is freedom. It's falling on every space. There is freedom. Oh, we bless you, Jesus. Oh, we bless your holy name. Oh, we bless your name, O oh Lord. You are welcome here, Jesus. You are welcome in this place. You are welcome in this place, Jesus. There is freedom. There is freedom. There is freedom. Every chain will fall, and every chain will fall, and every prison door be opened in his name, and every chain will fall, and every bondage break, cause there's freedom in his name, there is freedom in his name, Whoa. There is freedom, there is freedom, there is healing, there is peace, let your healing waters 
I just see you laying your hands on your head right now. Just lay your hands on your head. I speak peace, peace, peace in you, peace, peace. thank you for your presence, God. We thank you that we are never alone, God. We thank you that your presence, God, is our promise. We thank you that there is no one in heaven or on earth who can compare to the richness of your comfort and your counsel. We thank you because you are kind and you are generous and you hold nothing back. We thank you that in this moment you are binding up wounds that we have no idea are still hurting. We thank you that you are comforting us by your love. We thank you for songs of deliverance that you sing over our lives. We thank you now for the deliverance of our children and for our children's children. We thank you for the blessing that is upon us, God, the blessing that we did not deserve, the blessing that we did not earn. We thank you that freely you have given. And so we commit ourselves to freely give out of the wellspring of mercy and the wellspring of grace that you have provided in our lives. I pray not one of us hold back. In the next coming days, I pray that when we find a need, that we would fill it. I pray that we would be your hands and feet in the earth. I pray that as you bind up the uncertainty within us, that we would be a healing agent and a, 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 an agent of peace to those around us who are unable to find comfort and peace in this season. I ask right now, God, that every woman under the sound of my voice would walk according to the mandates of heaven and the calling upon her life. I declare and release every woman to go forth in confidence in the anointing of the Holy Spirit that has been given to them at their birth in Jesus' name. I declare every woman under the sound of my voice will move forward in this season and be prosperous and successful, lacking nothing emotionally, physically, or spiritually. We thank you that you are working on our behalf and that we are found in the favor of our God. We thank you for community. We thank you for the church. We thank you for our government. We pray that you would keep these institutions intact by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray influence of the Holy Ghost first and foremost in the house of God. I speak a blessing over Fordham Manor Church right now in Jesus' name. I thank you for the family legacy that's here, God. I thank you, Lord, that your presence will always be a safe place for people to run into in this house. I thank you for every pastor. I thank you for every leader. I thank you for every servant. I thank you for every prayer warrior. I thank you for every intercessor. I thank you for every greeter. I thank you for everyone who gives out coffee or a cold cup of water to those hurting or in need. I thank you, Lord God, from the top to the bottom, from the bottom to the top, I thank you that you establish this house in your glory and within your presence. I thank you that this house will withstand the seasons. I thank you it will withstand the changes in culture. I thank you, Father, that it will surpass what people have said about this house. And I thank you and cut down every word that was spoken against this house in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that this house was created 
by the hands of our Father, and it will remain until the coming of Christ. And so we honor you in this place. I set up an altar here, and I worship you. We love you because you're a good, good Father in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. Amen.